welcome everyone and thank you for attending this webinar with Fullscript and Dr. Nalini Chilkov. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I'm part of the marketing team here at Fullscript and we're very excited to have Dr. Nalini Chilkov here with us today to help us understand the effects of aging on the immune system among many other things I'm sure. Um, before we get into the presentation though, I wanted to go through a little housekeeping. Just a reminder that this is being recorded and you will uh, get access to the recording as soon as the event's over. We package it up and send an email to all registrants. So you'll have it in your inbox. And we also post all of our um, webinars on our website at fullscript.com slash webinars. So you can access all of the past webinars and upcoming webinars there as well. And if you uh, have any questions throughout the presentation, there is a um, questions drop down on your dashboard or like a section for questions and you can add them there and we will do a live Q&A towards the end of the hour. Um, and yeah, that is, there'll be the live Q&A. So that's the question section. And other than that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nelly Michalkov for being here today. If you don't know, she is a licensed acupuncturist, doctor of oriental medicine, and the founder of integrativecanceranswers.com. She is a respected expert in uh, collaborative integrative cancer care, known both for her meticulous attention to detail and individualized treatment plans, as well as her warmth and compassion. She is a seasoned clinician and innovator, building bridges between modern and traditional healing paradigms and partnering physicians to provide the best outcomes for their patients. She's been a lecturer at the School of Medicine at UCLA and UC Irvine in California. And as well, she has uh, been a lecturer at many schools of traditional uh, oriental and naturopathic medicine over her long career. And over the past 30 years, Dr. Chokov has helped thousands of people many with serious and chronic illnesses achieve and maintain extraordinary health and longevity. I could go on and on about all the accomplishments and we are very, very excited to have Dr. Chilkov here today with us. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to you and I'll disappear for a little bit and uh, rejoin close to the end for the Q&A. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna talk today about immunity and aging. But I want to preface this by saying that mitochondria are really important to understand in terms of aging and, and the diseases of aging. And last summer, I did a lecture for Fullscript on the importance of mitochondria in health and disease and cancer, which is my specialty. So I want to encourage you to also listen to that lecture because it'll give you a good foundation for where we're going to go today in this lecture. Uh, so uh, there's some background that, if you if you need it, is on last summer's lecture. All right. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at the physiology of aging from the point of view of caloric restriction, the uh, neuroinflammation process in the brain, the importance of the mitochondria in the NAD pathways, the CERT-1 activation, mTOR inhibition, and autophagy and mitophagy. And if you don't know what those are, you will by the end of this hour. And uh, because it's a rather complex topic and it really could be a two-day workshop, I'm going to hit these big ideas so that you're aware how important they are and to understand this is occurring inside the mitochondria for the most part. And uh, that I made some summary notes. So you kind of have a study uh, cheat sheet. So there's a link on this slide here if you want to download that uh, and have that as a reference for yourself along with the slides. So it's important that we kind of uh, differentiate between lifespan and health span. I don't think anyone wants to live into old age not being able to engage fully in life. So it's more important to me that we as clinicians are providing health span to our patients, a, a, a long life that's also a healthy, robust life with good function and uh, the ability to live life fully and the ability to provide patients with a, a way of delaying physiologic downfall, you know, and, and uh, going down into entropy, which is the direction all biological systems go to from organization to chaos and disorganization. So we want to have healthy aging, not just long lives. And so I think that's important. What, what are we up to? What do we want here anyway? 
So there's a, a couple of important concepts to get, and then we'll go into the biochemistry of all of this. So immune aging is really, uh, you know, how wear and tear on the immune system where uh, gene expression gets altered, DNA gets damaged, both in the nucleus and the mitochondria, but also the epigenetic events that accumulate throughout a lifespan that influence gene expression, gene protection, and that lead to a decline in immune function, both parts of our immune system, the innate and the adaptive immune systems. And so, uh, you know, remembering that part of our immune system is, you know, quick response, and then a part of our immune system has a memory. And so we need both parts of that so that we can uh, quickly respond to insults, but also remember how to respond to things we've been exposed to before. And most of the aging process, including the aging of the immune system, is uh, a lot driven by in inflammation and triggers of inflammation, as well as environmental insults. And so, of course, uh, we want to be attending to to those factors as well. But there's another part of immune aging that we call immunosenescence. And so if you think of the word senile, you'll get the concept here. So the cells become somewhat dormant and dysfunctional. They are no longer robust functional immune cells. And not only do they sort of go into retirement and go to sleep, but they begin to have these traits in which they actually secrete inflammatory cytokines including IL-6 and IL-8, which are involved in tissue damage and mitochondrial damage and in cancer physiology and in the physiology of brain aging and cardiovascular aging. And so um, there's a phenotype that's called SASP or the senescence associated secretory phenotype. And that means these senescent cells that are producing more inflammatory cytokines. And so as we age, we become more inflamed and less robust in our, in our immune capacity. And so we're living with less uh, ability to respond along with more inflammation, just, just as a fact of aging. You know, there's other things that are factors in aging we won't be talking about today, such as, as uh, sarcopenia and osteopenia. Uh, and so you have to just be watching your patients because some people start to age early and some people, you know, are, are really in great shape into their seventies and eighties. And so you have to watch your patients to see these early signs so that you can intervene and keep them healthy for a long period of time. And I will disclose to you that I am heading towards 70 and I am a very young 70, but that's because I have engaged in a lifestyle and nutraceuticals and botanicals that keep my mitochondria healthy and, and keep me with epigenetic signaling that protects my DNA and protects me from expressing the pathologies that run in my family. And so that's what we want to help our patients do is to not live out their genetic potential for chronic illness, but actually maintain a healthy physiology. And so we'll learn the pathways that are very much involved with that today, some of the main pathways, and then we'll um, look at what kind of interventions uh, you can do with your patients. So we have, we just talked about immune senescence, but in general, all cells go through senescence as part of the aging process. And so it's kind of like a loss of fitness and higher risk for disease and mortality. And so um, this can be an a, a irreversible process in which cells uh, lose their ability to divide. And so uh, there's not renewal. There's a loss of renewal. And so there's another uh, sort of moniker called AASP, Aging Associated Secretory Phenotype, and uh, also the Senescence Associated Secretory Phenotype. And this is when cells become dysfunctional and lazy and damaged. And they then are increasing the expression, not only of inflammatory cytokines, but also NF-kappa B, which is sort of the upstream nuclear factor from which most inflammation, uh, inflammatory cytokines and molecules flow. We'll talk about mTOR today and its impact on aging. Uh, transforming growth factor beta is also an inflammatory cytokine, also a growth factor that drives cancer. 
Uh, interleukin-1, IL-1 is another inflammatory cytokine along with IL-6 and NF-kappa-B that are present in almost all cancer patients. And uh, P53 is the guardian of the genome. It is a uh, factor that allows cells to recognize when they're damaged, unhealthy, or aberrant, and initiate housekeeping, initiating apoptosis and autophagy and mitophagy, the housekeeping, recycling, uh, normal biology that says, let's get rid of unhealthy cells and recycle them and their, their building blocks and make new healthy cells out of them. And we'll talk about that today. And then MMP, the matrix metalloproteinases, which are enzymes that actually are quite damaging to barriers and membranes. And uh, it's one of the set of enzymes very prominent in cancer, for example, that allows a tumor to invade the extracellular space. And so we get an upregulation of these sort of damaging and inflammatory uh, pathways and the dysregulation of normal cell recycling. And this is part of what the aging physiology is. And so we have both increased inflammation and resistance to the normal housekeeping of apoptosis and autophagy. So let's just look at this a little bit more closely here. Telomeres are um, moieties on the end of your, on the tails of your DNA. And every time a cell divides, you lose uh, a telomere. And so over the course of your life, your telomeres keep shortening. And when you lose your telomeres, then cells die. And so um, some of the preservation of telomeres is uh, lifestyle related, epigenetic related, in terms of diet and, and uh, antioxidants. And, you know, I always tell patients eat the rainbow because then you're getting a wide variety of phytochemicals that are protective to DNA, to cells, to uh, scavenging reactive oxygen species and reducing oxidative stress. And uh, so we want to try to give patients simple lifestyle interventions that actually protect their cells. And so we want to protect the DNA from being damaged. And remember that the DNA in the nucleus is very protected. It's all the way in there inside the nucleus. But the mitochondrial DNA in the cytoplasm is very, very vulnerable, and it's vulnerable to damage. It's vulnerable to exposure to environmental toxins, oxidative stress. The mitochondria is a very high oxidative environment to begin with, so we have to have the ability to quench oxidative stress, and uh, so that becomes very important. So we'll look at all of that. And so this little uh, left side of this slide is just showing the cell cycle and how it can be disrupted. And when the DNA is damaged, and then we can have a cancer cell develop. And in that environment, we have uh, an increase in very specific uh, inflammatory cytokines, matrix metalloproteinases, and then we have this senescence-associated secretory phenotype of aberrant cells and lots of inflammation uh, present. And that's our, our age-related kind of pathologic physiology. And so in, in the state of cellular senescence, we're not having normal cell division. So we're losing that normal cell function. We have the persistence of inflammation. We have impaired regenerative capacity because we have stem cells uh, also get senescent. We have the regular cells get senescent and aren't dividing so they can't regenerate. We have the, the uh, absence of autophagy and apoptosis. And then um, all of this alters uh, what's happening with nearby cells, which then also be, uh, get to have a pathologic physiology because of all these inflammatory cytokines in, in the soup. And we have the matrix metalloproteinases, these protease-mediated uh, extracellular matrix degradation enzymes that are breaking down sort of the structures that hold our, our uh, cellular matrix together. So this is not a physiology anybody wants to have. So uh, when we age and the immune system becomes senescent, then it's kind of a, a, a feed forward kind of a physiology that sort of perpetuates itself. And so we want to try and interrupt that so that instead of, of continuing to have an aging 
uh, dysfunctional physiology, we can uh, promote a, a healthy, self-regulating, self-renewing physiology, which is more typical of youth. So here's the deal. Baby boomers like myself, we are aging. And so I'm kind of in the middle of the baby boomer generation. So a lot of my friends are, are ready to celebrate their 80th birthday. But in the next 30 years, we'll be living on a planet where the number of people over 80 is going to triple. And so who's going to take care of all of us? So I'm counting on all you younger doctors to take care of me. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. So the other thing you want to understand and watch for in your patients is something we call frailty, which is actually a medical term. And so, of course, when we're young, we have a high level of fitness. And then we go through stages where we lose, continue to lose function because of this cellular senescence that starts to happen. And, you know, we adapt to new normals, but over time we become more vulnerable. Over time we can't do activities of daily living, need assistance, maybe can't walk and become bedridden. And then, you know, organ failure of some kind occurs and, and death follows. And so it, there's some interesting statistics that show if you're healthy, pretty healthy uh, in your 50s and 60s, that you'll have about one year of very poor health before you die. But if in midlife you have poor health, you may have five or six years of very compromised, poor quality life before you die. So it's it you can sort of compress this process into one year uh, of dying. And, and uh, I will tell you, I've been uh, working in integrative oncology primarily for 30 years now, and it takes a long time to die. So you wanna actually preserve your ability to have, have health span and a high quality of life because um, nobody dies instantly except the fair, very few people who you know have an accident or a sudden stroke or embolism, but mostly it's a downhill slide. And so we want to try and compress that into the last year of someone's life and hopefully when they're like 98 years old or something. So frailty, look for these signs and symptoms of frailty abnormal weight loss, sarcopenia, osteopenia, anemia, the bone marrow starts to fail and not be able to make enough blood cells. There's autom autonomic dysfunction, lack of, of self-regulation, uh, heart rate, uh, respiratory rate, blood pressure, things like that, uh, cognitive decline, impaired motor and sensory function, uh, fatigue, exhaustion. We talked about more inflammation, but this is coupled with more coagulation as well. An uh, inflammatory environment is a pro-coagulation environment. Uh, the di digestive system starts to be less efficient. So even if someone's eating well, they tend not to be able to digest or absorb their food. Normally we have hypoglycemia as we age in our stomach and therefore we can't sterilize our food. We have more uh, microorganisms that are pathogenic in our digestive tract and we have more malnutrition in in elders, both because of behavior, because of not having such a great sense of smell or taste anymore, and not being so interested in food, or just sort of, uh, in our culture, isolation, lack of social support. Uh, eating tends to be a social behavior, and so elders who are isolated tend not to eat. Sometimes you'll have an elder in your practice who's just very fatigued. You just give them some B vitamins, and they perk up because they're just malnourished. So you have to know your patient well, know what's contributing to their loss of, of thriving, really. So um, this is kind of, you know, what to look for in frailty. But I want to point out here, walking speed is one of the uh, earliest signs of frailty in elders. When you see someone that starts to slow down in their walking or have trouble walking, that's a sign that their whole system is really in great decline. So in age, we have, you know, malnutrition, and, and that undernutrition also then, of course, has its own consequences. But remember, sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, is a part of aging. And so if elders are not eating enough protein and using their muscles, they're going to have rapid loss of muscle mass, which then leads to more uh, loss of balance, loss of fine motor control, more falls in elders. And so we want to make sure that people are uh, maintaining some uh, healthy level of muscle mass and muscle tone. And so, of course, 
hormones and inflammation and coagulation factors are affecting all of these things. We get a decline in the metabolic rate, so things are just slowing down. The engine is slowing down. We get more insulin resistance. We get more loss of, of bone mass. We get less efficient use of oxygen and and we get weakness and uh and you know tendency to want to be less physically active because you don't feel strong or safe and so uh it's just kind of a vicious cycle so we want to try and keep elders out of this we don't want this frailty to happen and so uh watch for the early signs because if you of course if you intervene early you're going to have more opportunity to reverse things or at least slow them down right and preserve quality of life and meaning health span, right? Health span you want. And so just to summarize, these are, are um, some of the things that are happening in frailty, uh, characterized by lots of inflammation and the immune senescence. But, you know, um, cancer is a disease of aging. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on another slide. But, you know, due to all these factors, and so it's not only that we get cancer because our immune system becomes more senescent, we have all these other factors going on in our cells, which compromise the body's ability to respond to a cancer cell, to recognize a cancer cell, to take control of it. So uh, a lot of the things that we, um, that I focus on in cancer patients are really a part of the physiology of aging or a part of the physiology of a inefficient system that's no longer robust. So I just wanna talk about cancer a little bit because that's, that's what I do all day long. and um, to to point this out to you that the number of cancer survivors is going to increase to about 22 million in the year 2030, 26 million in the year 2040. And, and most cancer survivors are actually living 10 to 20 years after, right? So 67% uh, live for five years, 45% live 10 years after their treatment or their diagnosis, and 18% live 20 years. But one in two Americans is going to be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. So you're going to have a lot of people in your practice who have cancer histories. So uh, one of my missions is to train frontline clinicians who aren't practicing oncology, but uh, you're all going to have elders in your practice, and a lot of them, at least half of them, will be cancer survivors. And so you need to know how to take care of them, what their unique needs are. And so uh, I just think it's so important because if you didn't study oncology, you don't know the needs of people with a cancer history, what's unique about their physiology and what can really, really support them. And so cancer is a disease of aging and the most common cancers for which people live a long time afterwards as survivors are breast, prostate, and colorectal cancers. So if you do nothing else, learn about the survivors of these three types of cancers so you know how to take care of them. And those that you're going to see a lot of people with these histories in your practices the longer you're in practice. So towards that end, I just want to give a little plug for my online training uh, because if you're interested in this, then uh, I welcome you into our community. And I have an online course. It's self-paced, and I also have monthly live mentoring so that you can learn how to, to to manage your cases. And I'm offering everybody in the full script community a 10% discount through the end of June. And if you want to talk to us about it, just reach out. Uh, but this is uh, something that's my passion. It's really what my work is about now. So let's look at the hallmarks of aging. In my course, I talk about the hallmarks of cancer. And so you want to understand what are the physiologic characteristics of cancer? What are the char characteristics of the aging physiology? So Let's look at them in a couple of groups. And this is a fabulous paper that this came from. And so we get uh, genomic instability, meaning the DNA is damaged. We get an attrition of telomeres. I mentioned every time your cells divide, you lose some telomeres. And so the longer you live, the less telomeres you have, the less protected your DNA is. Therefore, you get more genomic instability. We also get uh, alterations in gene expression due to epigenetic factors. These are envir environmental and behavioral factors that change whether or not we have genes that protect our cells or genes that damage our cells. We have uh, pro uh, proliferative uh, cancer genes and we have cancer control genes. 
and this is true of, of the nervous system, the cardiovascular system as well. And then we also get this loss of proteostasis, meaning that the genes that are, what do genes do? They map for functional and structural proteins, right? So proteins are either enzymes or, or collagen or muscle fibers, connective tissue, fascia. And so we start to lose the scaffolding of our structure. We lose our muscle mass, our bone mass, our connective tissue. And we also lose the enzymes that drive the machinery of cells, right? And so we're just becoming more vulnerable and less efficient uh, biologically. And then we also have this deregulation of what we call nutrient sensing. So the body doesn't know when it needs nutrients or calories or protein or carbohydrates or vitamins. And so uh, we start to not actually have the nutrients we need for optimized function and we lose our sense of smell and taste and our, our ability to know when we're full and when we're hungry. Uh, so all of these things become inefficient. And the, at the core of it, in my mind, is really my, mitochondrial dysfunction is, is crucial. If you don't have healthy mitochondrial function, you won't have health. So I focus very much on that. And you know, there's this term called uh, being a mitochondriac. And if you study with me, you will definitely become one because the mitochondria are so important and you should be fascinated by them. And then we end up with this cellular senescence, which we talked about in our introduction. Along with that, there are stem cells, you know, that are kind of our reserve cells that are pluripotent kind of cells that can step up and solve a lot of problems. But stem cells become exhausted and old and senescent as we age as well. So we don't have that reserve of solutions or regeneration anymore. And then we also have this alteration in intercellular communication, which causes our physiology to be a coordinated symphony instead of dissonant music. And so um, this is, you know, the, the direction none of us want to go in. And so um, let's look here. I think this is really kind of a, it'll give you a little more solid sense of what leads to aging and what uh, what doesn't. So when you're young, you, you'll have damage to your cells. It's just part of living on planet Earth in a body. And, and th there's not much cellular senescence. And so cells solve problems, they recycle, and you have basically a homeostatic uh, problem solving uh, physiology. And if your cells are able to uh, block proliferation of damaged cells and recycle the damaged cells through apoptosis and autophagy, you don't develop cancer and you don't develop the aging physiology. However, when you're older, you can't really respond to this damage as well. So damage accumulates, repair decreases, the clearance uh, and cell renewal that happen when you have autophagy and apoptosis uh, are no longer highly efficient. And so you get all these senescent dysfunctional cells that are secreting lots of inflammatory cytokines, flooding the environment, infecting adjacent cells and stem cell exhaustion. And then all this decreased tissue function is a pro-aging physiology, whereas if you um, still have some of the function uh, uh, here you can actually block some of the aging and cancer proliferative effects. But, you know, this is just what happens as we age. So we want to oppose this for as long as possible. When stem cells get exhausted, whether these are hematopoietic, muscular, satellite cells, or uh, intestinal epithelial stem cells, we get dysfunctions in all those areas. So the bone marrow fails us. But a, a characteristic of aging is not being able to make enough blood cells. So there's an anemia of aging, uh, but that's in the, the very old, typically. And in people who have cancer histories, uh, quite often in people who've had chemotherapy, also can suffer from that. So you have to monitor function of the bone marrow, monitor, monitor uh, the uh, bone mass. And I start by uh, having both men and women do a baseline a DEXA scan to look at bone density at age 50. And then uh, you have a baseline and you can see whether or not someone is rapidly or slowly losing bone mass. You do that about every two years. That's part of a good functional medicine health model. Uh, you wanna, as I said, um, be watchful of sarcopenia and make sure people have adequate uh, weight bearing activity and adequate uh, protein intake. A lot of elders 
eat less and less and less protein. And actually, as we age, we, we will have rapid sarcopenia and osteopenia uh, if we don't eat enough uh, protein, and then we lose our hydrochloric acid, so we can't digest protein. So some elders need digestive herbs or digestive enzymes. And also, I'll show you a slide where the intestinal function of elders is quite disrupted. Not only is peristalsis disrupted, the secretion of hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, but also the microbiome in elders is quite different than in young people. And this is thought to contribute to the impaired immune function and the impaired uh, inflammation control of elders also. So you can't talk about anything without talking about the microbiome today. And then when cells don't communicate with one another, then all of these regulatory functions also get uh, dysregulated. So neuroendocrine function becomes dysregulated, uh, inflammation becomes predominant and uh, has this feed forward cycle of creating more oxidative stress, more inflammation, more tissue damage. Uh, we talked about immunosenescence and the bystander effects are what happens to all the cells next door when that's happening. And so, uh, you know, we live in a community of cells in our body. So let's look at the things that make the most difference in opposing this physiology of aging. So caloric, caloric restriction is most studied uh, longevity intervention, and it is uh, considered the most effective intervention into the aging process. And if you think about human history, we are not designed to eat 24 seven. We're actually designed to eat and fast and eat and fast and eat and fast. And there was no such thing as refrigeration or uh, a continuous reliable supply of food. And so uh, at least you would eat during the daytime and not eat at night. And you know, with electricity, refrigeration and 24 seven stores, we can eat all day long, but our, our physiology does not thrive doing that. So restricting calories uh, is a way to slow down the aging process. When you do that, you gra greatly reduce oxidative stress, DNA damage, cell division, all these things that are part of the aging physiology, and you can get up to a 50% increase in lifespan. There are people that uh, restrict calories by at least 25% as a lifestyle uh, towards uh, uh, longevity and healthy aging. And this caloric restriction affects DNA methylation, DNA, DNA acetylation, and the uh, production of sirtuins, which I'm gonna talk about in detail. And so uh, there's a lot of epigenetic signaling that changes what the DNA is doing as a result of caloric restriction. And so I'll, I'll uh, talk about what to recommend to patients shortly because uh, remember, elders are fragile. You have to be middle path and careful and even conservative with elders who have more fragile physiology. When you're young, you can do more extreme therapies, but when you're older, you have to be more careful. So caloric restriction, it delays and slows down this whole process I just described to you. And it does that by changing uh, epigenetic signaling and gene expression. So we get changes in DNA methylation and histone modifications. And this leads to a reversal of aberrant gene expression, maintenance of chromatin or DNA stability, and a delay of the aging process and aging-related diseases. And in the middle there um, are the there are multiple complex pathways and genes that I'm going to talk about some of them. And so you'll see you'll see more details of these pathways. But those are the big ideas: DNA methylation and DNA, DNA histone acetylation are the protective mechanisms and a caloric restriction increases that. So there are a couple of really important pathways and genes just kind of get, get in your mind. So over here, P10 is a tumor suppressor gene, okay? And where is my mTOR? Somewhere in here it should be mTOR, mTOR, okay. So this is a tumor promoter gene, but these are also uh, genes that promote aging. So we wanna block mTOR and promote P10. If we promote P10, we get an inhibition of these pathways. Oops, sorry. We get an inhibition of these pathways that lead to uh, 
tissue damage, aging physiologies, cancer physiologies. So our goal is to promote the things in green on this and inhibit the things in gold, basically. So we want to uh, look at how dietary restriction will uh, lead to increased sirtuins, increased AMPK, I'm gonna talk about that, inhibition of mTOR, and also uh, we wanna look at how we can decrease DNA damage. So caloric restriction also does that, and uh, we have a great, great impact on mitochondrial function. So if we inhibit mitochondrial dysfunction, then we also inhibit rapid aging. And that is because uh, the mitochondria govern really the, the, the uh, metabolism of every single cell. And also mitochondria will signal uh, the apoptosis and autophagy, the house cleaning of, of our damaged cells. And so dietary restriction has a big impact on all of this. And so there's a couple molecules to be um, uh, aware of and you'll learn more about over time. P10. Uh, is a tumor suppressor, pro-longevity gene. mTOR is a, a tumor promoter, uh, pro-aging gene. FOXO is a longevity transcription factor that we can turn on, for example, by dietary restriction. And also um, PGC1A, you'll see that in a lot of the pathways, peroxisome proliferated coactivator 1-alpha. This is also very important. So we're gonna try and activate CERT1, PGC1A, AMPK, P10 and FOXO. And then we want to do things that produce a hormetic response. So hormesis is the idea that when over the course of our lifetime we're exposed to small stressors, uh, say uh, you do high intensity interval training, or you, you know, ha uh, do a long hike, or you deliver a baby. These are, <laughs> these are stressors that teach the body how to respond to stress. So small doses of stress actually improve our response to stress, our body's ability to learn how to respond to stress. And so this leads to better control of all these uh, uh, pathways that damage cells and more cell survival and then in inhibition of aging. So as I told you, this could be a two-day workshop. So i just give you the big ideas. You can come back and look up at the details of these pathways. Uh, it takes some time to kind of get the flow of it. But uh, to, to just summarize this idea of caloric restriction, most of the research has been done in animals, but there are humans who have engaged in, in caloric restriction as a lifestyle and in, in studies. So we have some human studies, uh, but caloric restriction really impacts a lot of the diseases of aging, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, and immune deficiencies. It delays the onset of all of these diseases. And so if, if someone says to you, you know, what's the most powerful thing I could do to have healthy aging and a, a, a long health span is caloric restriction. So there are different ways to accomplish that. We'll, we'll talk about that. But the most, mostly I recommend intermittent fasting because it's really the safest for elders and it's the safest for anyone with a chronic illness. It's the safest for anybody who has, uh, you know, is maintained on medications and can't do, you know, uh, other kinds of fasting. Uh, so if you combine intermittent fasting, I'll explain to you uh, that in a moment, with an epigenetic diet, what does that mean? That means a diet that's full of, uh, that's plant strong and full of different colors of phytochemicals and has adequate macronutrients in it, adequate proteins, healthy fats, and um, moderation of carbohydrates. That's the best kind of a diet for elders. And uh, intermittent fasting means that in any 24 hour period, you will have a window of no calories. And the studies show that longevity is promoted and cancer is inhibited and cancer recurrence is inhibited if you fast 13 hours for every 24 hour period. So I instruct my patients to fast for 13 hours between tonight's dinner and tomorrow's breakfast. And that can be a lifestyle for anyone. And this is good for young people also because it just mimics how early humans lived and it is actually how we were designed. Eat fast, eat fast, eat fast. So that's what we call it breakfast, breakfast, because you're supposed to have not eaten for many hours 
uh, over nighttime. And so if you can teach your patients to have 13 hours between dinner and breakfast, then they will have huge benefits to their um, protection of their DNA, slow down cell senescence, slow down immunosenescence, slow down risk of all the diseases of aging, slow down cancer and cancer recurrence. And one of the things that happens when you do fasting is not only do you get this um, ramping up of your immune system and this increase in autophagy, and I'll, I'm going to talk specifically about autophagy later, but you get a restraint of insulin secretion and insulin-like growth factor one signaling. And this is a, a physiology in which age-related diseases are promoted, especially cancer is promoted. So I monitor hemoglobin A1C, insulin, and IGF-1 in the blood of all my patients, and my cancer patients, because you want to keep insulin, glucose, and IGF-1 in the lowest quartile of normal to prevent cancer and cancer recurrence. And so uh, there are things, biomarkers we can measure to see if we're accomplishing a physiology that has the potential for longevity and for health span. And when we fast, we also trigger housekeeping, uh, apoptosis and autophagy. Remember what these are. Apoptosis is initiated by the mitochondria. Autophagy uh, is also signaled by the mitochondria. And they're just different mechanisms where, where cells commit suicide. They self-destruct, recycle their raw materials, and thereby get rid of unhealthy aberrant cells. In a body where that's not happening, uh, aberrant diseased cells are allowed to persist, and then chronic disease ensues. So we also get this upregulation of activated protein kinase. And this is very important in, along with sirtuins, which we'll talk about, because you get a downregulation of the IGF-1, and then you get less uh, aging physiology, less pro-cancer physiology. So caloric restriction by intermittent fasting is what I recommend is the safest way to go. And uh, then you also get reduced inflammation, reduced oxidative stress, uh, improvement in, bio, in mitochondrial function and mitochondrial biogenesis, and an upregulation of the detoxification pathways as well. So that sort of keeps you in balance and you get this more normal regulation of cell proliferation and differentiation uh, by the nucleus. So that's the epigenetic effect that you get from calorie restriction. You also get that by sleeping enough, by exercising enough, by hydrating enough, by modulating your stress. All the basics of a healthy lifestyle have this same kind of impact. So this is really the same diagram I just showed you just from a, a different uh, publication. Uh, but I want to point out, rather than going through all the pathways again, because they're the same ones that we just looked at, is what are the outcomes we're looking for? We're looking for an inhibition of NF-kappa B and a decrease in inflammation and cell proliferation. We're looking for an upregulation of NERF2, which is a nuclear factor that turns on uh, oxidative protection in cells and ends up protecting the lining of our blood vessels, our brain, our neurons, and our, our connective tissue. And um, this decrease in oxidative stress is the outcome of an upregulation of NERF2. Uh, for example, all the cruciferous vegetables rich in sulforaphanes uh, increase NERF2. We also want to decrease the, the expression of IGF-1 and in insulin signaling so that we can inhibit mTOR, AKT, PI, 3 k is one pathway, and thereby decrease the development of uh, breast cancers, bone immune, and motor dysfunctions. So um, these are our goals. Like, what do we want to be doing? We want to upregulate AMPK and sirtuins, and this is also going to upregulate nitric oxide synthetase. So all of these things that are really protective are what we, we want to be doing. So this is just sort of the dark blue things are what we want to do. And one of the things that does that is caloric restriction. There's something called caloric restriction mimetics is instead of fasting, what could you do to produce this physiology? So resveratrol, for example, will uh, mimic a lot of these pathways uh, if you don't fast a lot, right? So there are patients for whom it is unsafe to fast. It is unsafe to do extreme 
or even moderate calorie restriction at times. So children and teenagers who are under 18 who are still growing should not engage in caloric restriction. Pregnant women breastfeeding mothers should not uh, be fasting. If someone is recovering from surgery, has an eating disorder, has type 1 diabetes and is insulin dependent, already has loss of muscle mass and sarcopenia or is underweight, has an active infection, someone who has mental illness, a person who can't self-regulate, and people on um, large classes of drugs. And in America, almost everyone who's an elder is on too many drugs. So there may be a large number of your patients who are not candidates for uh, caloric restriction and, and fasting. Many of those people can do intermittent fasting, the overnight fasting. And so if we just get people to stop eating after dinner, it improves their health. And we can do that without producing a lot of risk. So be mindful, you know, fasting isn't for everybody. And elders and people with cancer are fragile. So let's just briefly look at the inflammation of the brain uh, because the, and, and, you know, by extension, the uh, neuroinflammation, uh, inflammatory aging of the neurons of the eyes and the ears, you know, all the sense faculties, the taste, the things that we lose as we age, that's part of neuroimmunoinflammation. And because the, the auditory nerve and the optic nerve are extensions of the brain. And so that these, that's why elders lose these functions. So we want to be mindful of the fact that there's a reduction in sirtuin expression and nerve 2 expression. And there's an uptick of NFK kappa B uh, in the aging physiology, along with other pro-inflammatory factors that we've already mentioned. So this contributes to the damage of the neurons. And we also tend to have less pro-anti-inflammatory uh, protective uh, cytokines like IL-10. So the, we get more inflammatory and less inflammation control as we age. But a lot of phytochemicals will help to control these risk factors like curcumin, resveratrol, sulforaphane. These are things we can uh, include in an a, a anti-aging sort of a cell protective kind of a protocol uh, for elders. And, you know, I'd say anybody over 50 should be concerned about all these things, want to decrease inflammatory triggers and so of course we can do that with diet and lifestyle and phytochemicals quite easily i would also include omega-3 fatty acids in in the toolbox for that and then i just want to reiterate that the microbiome and the epithelial barrier the gi tract and the elderly is compromised and you always have to tend to that when you're trying to build health and longevity and health span and you know most elders have been treated by conventional Western medicine and had their microbiomes damaged by antibiotics and steroids and other treatments, chemotherapy, radiation um, damages. So we know that when a person has a normal, healthy, robust microbiome and does not have leaky gut syndrome because they have a healthy epithelial barrier, that they have more robust immunity, more normal health, less overall inflammation. So the key is um, not only to eat healthy bacteria, and so I encourage people to eat a variety of fermented foods in condiment-sized portions on a daily basis. And if your diet is plant-strong, you're going to have the soluble fibers that are required to uh, be the fuel uh, of the colonocytes and the probiotics in the gut and allow the production of short-chain fatty acids so that you have a normal uh, microbiome that is not pro-inflammatory. So you need prebiotics, those are the plant fibers, the soluble fibers, and you need probiotics, the healthy bacteria. But what we have learned is putting 50 billion healthy bacteria into someone's gut and just putting two organisms like, you know, bifidus and lactobacillus acidophilus actually totally imbalances the microbiome because our microbiome is made up of a huge variety of microorganisms, sort of, I think that the way we've been using oral probiotics is not really skillful. Uh, I'm not saying don't do it, but you have to just understand it's not recreating a normal biology in the gut. So it's important to understand, uh, you know, I, I'm sure many people are, are aware of what nutraceuticals and botanicals are uh, anti-inflammatory, 
But what crosses the blood-brain barrier? What actually enters the brain and impacts inflammation in the brain uh, is really important to understand too. So here's a list of, of agents that can be used in our patients and all the pathways that they enter. Uh, so you can you know, suggest someone drinks green tea on a daily basis, cooks with curcumin, uh, has a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids and fermented foods. And uh, one of my very favorite uh, Chinese herbs is Scutellaria bicolensis huang chin. It's used in almost every anti-tumor formula in modern Chinese uh, oncology care. But it also uh, is rich in berberine, which is a really important isoquinoline alkaloid in many medicinal plants. Berberine is what makes golden seal yellow and bitter, for example. And berberine not only um, has the capacity to be anti-inflammatory, but it also has anti-tumor activity. It actually causes a more healthy microbiome because we need these phytochemicals along with the probiotics to have a normal microbiome in the gut. And so you wanna look for plants like that. The Chinese mushrooms, such as Ganoderma, that's reishi mushroom, uh, not only are they used for longevity for a variety of reasons, they regulate insulin and blood sugar, they're anti-inflammatory, they modulate immunity, and they have anti-tumor activity. And they were also used in Taoist practice for uh, meditation, enhancing meditation. So I always like to use Chinese mushrooms in my protocols. And uh, resveratrol, of course, is one of the only phytochemicals that has really solid research in humans demonstrating it is a pro-longevity phytochemical. And uh, Boswellia is also one of my favorite um, uh, phytochemicals. This is uh, frankincense. And you wanna look for a supplement that's high in alpha keto boswellic acids primarily. But So this is just a list of things that cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's important in elders because their brains are inflamed and we want to uh, decrease that. Most of the neurodegenerative disorders are inflammatory disorders. And so in the brain, we need to upregulate NERF2 and CERT1. And we can do that by using this, this list of, of uh, phytochemicals. Terostobin, it comes from blueberries. Ferulic acid comes from um, the soil and also from strawberries. So it's not hard to uh, get uh, these, these nutrients into the diet, but also you wanna remember there's a, a dietary, nutritional dose of things, and then there's a therapeutic dose. So I might use you know, 2,000 milligrams of resveratrol and curcumin and sulforaphanes and uh, 4,000 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids in a, as a therapeutic dose to address somebody who has neurodegenerative brain disease. Remember that mental illness also, mood dysregulation is all anxiety and depression, for example, are uh, inflammatory conditions of the brain. IL-6 is very upregulated in depression, for example. And so patients who don't respond to antidepressants often respond to anti-inflammatories for management of their mood disorders. So we have to be thoughtful about you know, what, what will really help someone. All right, so sirtuins. Sirtuins are really important. Uh, they're found in all, uh, from one cells to complex animals like mammals like us, they're found in all cells. And there are seven different sirtuins that are present in humans. Some are in the nucleus, some are in the mitochondria, some are in the cytosol. And there's an improvement in mitochondrial function and energy production. There's an activation of DNA repair in the telomeres. That's where the longevity research on resveratrol has concentrated. A promotion of healthy aging because of all these other things. Improvement in insulin sensitivity and fat burning. Uh, supporting uh, good neurobiology and stress resilience and reduction in inflammation. So activating sirtuins is one of our goals therapeutically. So the activation of sirtuins is a combination of activating the NAD-dependent deacetylases, which are regulators of lifespan, I'll show you what they are in a moment, and activating sirtuins. They work together. They, they have to be activated together. And so uh, the diseases of aging and mitochondria and cancer 
uh, diabetes are all impacted when you activate sirtuins and NAD. And so we get these effects uh, that promote health span and lifespan. And here's the seven sirtuins. So you'll see them called SIRT1, SIRT2, et cetera. And so we have things that can activate uh, the sirtuins. And so uh, let's just look at what SIRT1 does. It's one of the most studied in humans. It actually will upregulate apoptosis and autophagy, turn on house cleaning and housekeeping in the cell. It will promote DNA repair, controlling inflammation, normalize metabolism and energy production in the mitochondria, regulate oxidative stress and cerebral blood flow. And so you can see here all the genes that get turned on. And I wanna um, point out here, NLRP3, this is an inflammasome, and this is really important in COVID. This inflammasome is upregulated in COVID and we need to turn it down. It's one of the reasons there are cytokine storms in the lungs and uh, whole body systems of COVID patients. But there are other things that uh, upregulate the inflammasomes like cancer. Uh, here you see the mTOR pathway, the FOXO pathway, the BGC1A, things I've pointed out to you. Um, these things are all important, nitric oxide, AMPK, these, all of these here uh, are activated in the mitochondria. So BCL2 and VAX and P53, these are all signaling molecules that either uh, turn us towards or away from health. <clears throat> and very, these are all pathways that are involved in cancer as well, and most of the diseases of aging in, in some combination. So if we want to engage in activation of sirtuins as a longevity strategy, as a health span, lifespan strategy, there's lots of things that do that. So ginseng, uh, ginsenicides, salicides are found in rhodiola. Berberine is found in the Scutellaria bicolensis I just showed you. It's found in golden seal. Quercetin is found in most, most uh, of the plant foods that we eat. Uh, curcumin, of course, comes from uh, turmeric, and fisetin comes from uh, strawberries and raspberries. Uh, so uh, there's lots and lots of ways. Uh, what isn't here are still beans, and so uh, resveratrol and taro still bean could be in this list. Um, now, cofactors for sirtuin activation include uh, and reduced NAD activators. And so I'm going to talk to you about two supplements, NMM and NR, in a moment. Uh, we also just mentioned that caloric restriction and fasting and intermittent fasting uh, activate sirtuins, as does exercise. Okay. So middle path exercise, not excessive exercise. Excessive ex exercise can be destructive in elders because if, you know, when you do really, really strenuous exercise, you break down muscle mass, and it's really hard for elders to rebuild their muscle mass. So you have to do moderate exercise and exercise that uh, will uh, support the rebuilding of muscle mass, not just the breakdown of muscle mass. So this is um, from this great paper, and uh, the reference here, it's a 2020 publication, CERT-1 activation by natural phytochemicals. And so, they're showing how curcumin, resveratrol, berberine, quercetin, and fisetin upregulate CERT1 and activate all these other pathways and lead to mitochondrial biogenesis, an antioxidant effect, uh, fatty acid oxidation in the mitochondria, therefore energy efficiency, uh, and, um, and inflammatory control. And so uh, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to read these pathways to you, but I want to show you that it's important that the upregulation of CERT1 requires uh, the, the ability to, to provide uh, reduced NAD. And so I'll show you how, how we can do that. All right, so here is uh, another list of, of foods and phytochemicals that upregulate sirtuins. So it's not hard to do. So if you told someone to eat a plant strong diet that had a lot of color in it and had them eat healthy fats and oils, uh, you would be giving them a sirtuin triggering diet, okay? And so the phytochemicals in this food list include 
all of these things. Isoflavones, we didn't mention that uh, food source for that is primarily uh, traditional soy products. Uh, but most of these all come from plants of very various kinds. So plant strong diet is going to provide sirtuin uh, promoting foods. Not hard to do. Now let's talk about the, these uh, NAD plus precursors because they're required to get uh, sirtuin activation. And so NAD is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It's a it's a molecule present in the mitochondria. And uh, these two supplements, nicotinamide ribonucleoside and nicotinamide mononucleoside, are two supplements available uh, that we can take uh, to also sort of upregulate the mitochondria to produce more sirtuins and uh, have all these positive effects. So uh, the production of NAD tends to go down as we age. So one of a strategy uh, to uh, keep NAD levels higher in, in the aging population is to take these supplements. So uh, the precursors of NAD are in this B3 vitamin family, niacin, nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside, and, and the mononuclear riboside. There's lots and lots of research. The primary research on this was a guy named David Sinclair, and he has a lot of published papers, and he's also over, all over the internet, lots of YouTube videos, because he created a supplement company that um, makes the nicotinamide riboside. And so uh, he's a pretty interesting guy. He's a hard scientist. His research is really good. So if you take oral supplements of nicotinamide ribonucleoside or nicotinamide mononucleoside, along with something like resveratrol, which is a sirtuin promoter, you get an upregulation of NAD and an upregulation of SIRT1 expression, and then you get better mitochondrial and cellular health. So there's lots of companies that make these, and but they all come from the same manufacturers. There's not a lot of, of uh, manufacturers that make these molecules at this time, it's really new in the supplement industry. So you get better... Um, protection of your DNA, you get more cellular repair, you get more mitochondrial biogenesis so you can make more ATP, and you can't have really great sirtuin activity if you don't have enough NAD around. And so that's the main point here. And then that leads to these functions that we mentioned in the beginning that decline. You get healthier met metabolic function, including better fat and glucose utilization, you get more exercise efficiency and more healthy lean body. Why? Because your mitochondria are more efficient and you get this healthier methylation, which is necessary for detoxification, for neurotransmitter production and for DNA protection. And then you also end up with healthier homocysteine levels, all the direction we want to go in for more normal, healthy, younger type of a physiology. So um, the impact of taking these supplements is, you know, I've already mentioned all these things. So you look at dosing around 200 to 250 to 500 milligrams a day, but you have to combine it with something like resveratrol in order to get this effect. Either one by themselves, you don't get that effect. They're cofactors. And so uh, a little newer kit on the block is a newer supplement that's being made now called nicotinamide mononucleoside. And it has these same functions. It's just one step out in the, in the biochemical pathway. So it's thought to be a little bit more uh, absorbable and utilizable, but it's in, it is a CERT activator. So you can either take nicotinamide ribonucleoside or nicotinamide mononucleoside and combine it with resveratrol and get these fantastic anti-aging effects. So I recommend that to a lot of people. And here's a bunch of references on all of this for you. There's lots and lots of studies. You can also Google David Sinclair and see a lot of the, the uh, studies he did and a lot of his talks. Now, mTOR inhibition is linked to healthy longevity. And there's a whole bunch of people that take drugs that inhibit mTOR in, in an uh, effort to promote longevity, but a lot of those drugs have toxic side effects. So let's just look at phytochemicals that do that. Uh, what we're going to get by an inhibition of this pathway is we're going to get uh, an inhibition of uh, tumor promoter genes, an inhibition of proliferative genes to tumor cells, 
We're going to also get changes in cell senescence and uh, growth factors, nutrient use, energy production, stress response, all the things that we said at the beginning become compromised in aging physiology. So mTOR is one of these great regulatory molecules and it, it, it actually is found in almost every organism from single celled to complex organisms. And one of the reasons we want to inhibit it uh, in, in my specialty is because it's a tumor promoter. So this is where I came to study mTOR, but it is involved in not only in cancer, but in cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. And so by down-regulating mTOR, you down-regulate this activity that promotes these syndromes. And so it's a very powerful thing to do. So there's a drug called rapamycin that a lot of uh, people take, and it's not shown to work so great, but the nutraceuticals and phytochemicals seem to be nature's way of, of uh, safely doing this. But here's a study, right? Here's a study. Uh, extension of lifespan, amelioration of aging-related pathologies, including the declining immune function, was this phase 2A randomized placebo-controlled trial, and they used low doses of mTOR inhibitor therapy. And they found that these people in the study had enhanced immune function and decreased infection rates. And it was 264 elderly subjects. So that what's interesting in this study is that the effect um, lasted for a while as well. So um, this basically tells us that we can reduce infections, meaning make immune response more uh, activated, more robust, and improve overall immunity by inhibiting mTOR. And I will tell you, you also inhibit cancer risk when you do that. So one of the things that inhibits mTOR is caloric restriction and carbohydrate restriction and intermittent fasting. So um, these are, you know, not a pill you have to take, uh, and enters in these pathways by upregulating AMPK, which inhibits mTOR. Oops, sorry, go back. And um, downregulating this pathway, the insulin, insulin like growth factor, which leads to this pathway, which is a pro tumor, tumor genesis pathway as well. And so, inhibition of mTOR is very important in cancer, but also in all other. In, in diseases of aging. So there's quite a lot of phytochemicals that actually inhibit mTOR. These are the drugs that inhibit mTOR, but they have a lot of toxic effects. So I think that uh, just including uh, this, these ideas in uh, what do you wanna give an elder who wants to optimize their health as they age? And, and certainly you can start when you're 30 uh, to, to create this physiology. So uh, EGCG from green tea is named catechin in green tea, ginsenicide RG1, one of the most studied ginsenicides in, in Panax ginseng, that's uh, Chinese ginseng. Uh, astragalus is one of the great tonic longevity herbs of Chinese medicine uh, for many reasons, but this is one, it downregulates down mTOR. Curcumin we know has multiple, multiple effects. Uh, curcumin enters over 100 pathways that govern uh, cancer physiology, for example, resveratrol, and, and enters over 50 pathways that govern cancer physiology. Uh, so we see all these other uh, ways that include downregulation of mTOR, genistein, uh, soy and, and isoflavone, uh, also enters multiple pathways that control uh, estrogen-driven cancers. Estrogen-driven cancers are not only uh, breast cancers and uterine cancers, but also prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, brain cancer, all have estrogen receptors. So soy isoflavones are important. Uh, DIM uh, is um, a sulforaphane that is from cruciferous vegetables. So you have your patients eat lots of cabbage and kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Pinocchial is one of my favorite phytochemicals from the Chinese magnolia bark, and uh, it is really powerful in interrupting tumor genesis in a wide range of cancers. Uh, interestingly, caffeine downregulates mTOR. That's not a license to overdose yourself on caffeine. And one of the many functions of vitamin D, 
is also the down regulation of mTOR, which is why vitamin D is considered a longevity hormone nutraceutical. This is a really great paper, the mTOR signaling pathway in cancer and the potential mTOR inhibitory activities in natural phytochemicals. Great paper. So that's kind of overview. That's not so hard to downregulate mTOR. And then I took this chart from this paper, and I have three slides here of all the phytochemicals that were mentioned in this one paper and the different kinds of cancers that were studied. So you can just see curcumin, EGCG, um, isoliquiritidinin from uh, Chinese uh, licorice root, uh, slidricide from rhodiola, Ursolic acid is one of my favorite phytochemicals, used a lot in tumor genesis and cancer genesis inhibition. And uh, the herb that I use the most is um, Oldenlandia, which is rich in ursolic acid. I use that in a lot of my anti-tumor formulas uh, with a farinase from ashwagandha, uh, milk thistle, uh, chamomile, parsley, soy, hinocchial. So many different cancers and uh, so many easy to use phytochemicals. Uh, resveratrol, we've mentioned a lot. Bicalanine, that's from the school area. Bicalensis, that's also high in bar berberine. Quercetin uh, is rich in so many plants, so many of our food plants. Quercetin's active against a lot of different cancers. Uh, Eurolithin comes from uh, pomegranate. Vitamin D we mentioned, calorie restriction we mentioned, carbohydrate restriction we haven't talked a lot about. It has a really big impact on the metabolism of tumor cells. Uh, tumor cells are preferentially utilizing glucose and primarily getting growth signals from insulin in, in many strains of cancer. So if you just reduce carbohydrates, you take away those growth signals and that fuel. And omega-3 fatty acids actually inhibit mTOR. So uh, we have so many multitaskers, so many reasons to use things. So you can take a handful of, of these things and hit a lot of pathways. So the last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll go to Q&A, is autophagy and mitophagy, which I have referenced multiple times uh, in this talk. And it's really important to make sure that uh, autophagy, mitophagy, and also apoptosis are running properly. These are your quality control, recycling uh, normal physiologic processes. And so we want to make sure that we can do things where we no have normal cell cleanup and cell recycling. So you have to fast. You, ha you can't keep eating all the time. If you eat 24-7, if you eat all of your waking hours, your cells don't go into autophagy. So I teach patients to really stop eating after dinner. And um, that's just one of the most powerful ways to turn on autophagy. Intermittent fasting is one of the most powerful ways to turn on autophagy. So autophagy means the um, cell death that occurs from catabolic processes that degrade cellular contents and recycle the damaged organelles and building blocks of cells. Mitophagy simply refers to that same process in the mitochondria. So they're the same physiology, essentially. So I found this slide on a, a skin aging site, but I think it's a simple way uh, for those of you who are visual to see that when you upregulate uh, autophagy, you get a recycling of cellular waste and protein into its building blocks, amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, and nucleotides. And those become the building blocks of new healthy cells. And then as is the process of life, cells are stressed and become damaged or aged. And those aged cells have reduced autophagy. And so they can't regenerate or renew. So if we stimulate autophagy, we get more of a renewal process. Oops, sorry, let me go back. So we get this renewal process by stimulating autophagy. The simplest way to stimulate autophagy is to have periods of fasting. Simplest way. So mitophagy, uh, is also mediated, and, and autophagy, are mediated by CERT1. So every time we also upregulate CERT1, which we just talked about extensively and talked about phytochemicals that do that, we also stimulate autophagy and mitophagy. So we want to be sure that when cells are under stress or have become senescent aging cells, that we can recycle them and get rid of them. And so we have to trigger autophagy and mitophagy to get rid of, of the unhealthy cells. 
and recycle the building blocks. And so in the presence of stress, in the presence of an infection, if we can upregulate CERT1 and, and complement with uh, AMPK and NAD, we get autophagy, we inhibit aging, we inhibit viral replication, and we upregulate antioxidant cellular protection. So it's pretty simple, really. Uh, some really simple ideas. And so again, here's a list of things that will enhance and upregulate autophagy and mitophagy. So fasting, fasting mimicking diets like intermittent fasting, uh, like uh, ketogenic diets, which I don't recommend a lot. And I have an entire lecture on ketogenic diets. Um, you'll find that on the Designs for Health website. There's a lecture on mitochondria and ketogenic diets. Um, but a lot of our tonic longevity herbs actually are triggers for enhancing and upregulating autophagy and mitophagy. So Chinese medicine is full of these beautiful tonic herbs that are really plants that concentrate a lot of different phytochemicals and uh, micro minerals that aren't in food plants. And so ginseng, astragalus, schizandra berry is one of my favorite Chinese herbs bright red, full of antioxidants, one of the best uh, herbs in cancer as well. Romania glutinosa, uh, this is a, a kidney chi tonic herb, blood building herb, very, very mineral rich. Uh, ashwagandha is one of those self-regulatory, we might say uh, adaptogenic herbs. So um, these are rich, deeply nutrient rich kinds of, of plants. And then uh, in terms of isolated phytochemicals, we go back to the, the same sort of list, resveratrol, EGCG, curcumin, quercetin, solibinin from milk thistle. So you can see that there is a, a redundancy in the things that activate these multiple pathways which produce a, a healthy aging. And so you have to use 30 different things, basically. If you understand that uh, a lot of our therapeutic agents are multitaskers, then you can put together a, a plan that addresses so many different pathways with just a handful of supplements. So autophagy, I, I mentioned the easiest way to stimulate autophagy is to fast or just to stop eating overnight. And so if you, if you stop eating by calorie restriction or intermittent fasting, and then you get this uh, upregulation of this nutrient sensing physiology, which turns on autophagy, turns on uh, the immune system, and um, th this part has it in detail. So let me just say one more thing and then I'll, I'll go through this. So um, calorie restrictive, calorie restriction mimetic diets, okay? So these are things that mimic what happens when you do calorie restriction. So example of that would be resveratrol will trigger the same physiology that calorie restriction triggers. That's one of the reasons it's a anti-aging protective kind of a, a phytochemical. So calorie restriction or these calorie restricted restriction mimetics will also trigger autophagy, which lead to this improvement in all these functions, immune function, inflammation control, uh, autophagy, uh, apoptosis, mitophagy, the turnover of, of cell materials, uh, an amelioration, a support of healthy stem cell function, so we have this reserve for, for regeneration and improvement in proteostasis, right, in, in enzymes, functional proteins, structural proteins, muscle mass, bone mass, uh, collagen mass, and we get this ba nice balance of hormesis where we can withstand the stress of, stress of life and the body can learn to be adaptive and then we are in an anti-aging physiology. So that's a very poetic way to, to end this, I think. So uh, let's just summarize the big ideas that we went through. So we talked about caloric restriction. We talked about neuroinflammaging. We talked about NAD pre-cert curses and CERT-1 activation being a partnership. We talked about mTOR inhibition and uh, the stimulation of autophagy and mitophagy. All of these things transform immunity and the aging physiology. And here's your cheat sheet link also. It's a summary of the big ideas in this lecture. And these are the things that we mainly talked about in terms of nutraceuticals and phytochemicals. 
And these are things we often use in lots of other treatment plans, but I think to be aware, these supplements might be new to you, the nicotinamide riboside and nicotide mononucleotide, 250 to 500 milligrams a day, in combination with uh, resver resveratrol or terostilbene or any of the things on this list, actually. And if you'll notice, this list uh, is a list of uh, adaptogenic uh, phytochemicals, from adaptogenic phytochemicals and functional phytochemicals from uh, plants that are used in, in uh, Materia Medica for multiple syndromes, but mostly for chronic illnesses and the importance of omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D3. So these are, you know, a pretty simple toolbox out of which you can build a treatment plan. Just dosing wise, again, I use, uh, recommend uh, uh, two to six grams of omega-3 fatty acids a day to my patients, usually anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000 units of vitamin D3. I just mentioned the dose here and in phytochemicals, I'll dose these things anywhere from two to six grams, depending. So, you know, if you're not accustomed to using pharmacologic dosing, like six grams of curcumin, then just stick with 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams a day until you become um, more familiar with all of the functions of these uh, phytochemicals, which can be used pharmaceutically, pharmacologically. Uh, so you can really make a huge dent. I also just want to mention before we close the idea of the blue zones. And there were um, many longevity studies of people, different parts of the world who live to be 100 or more. And so um, these are called the blue zones. And it was, the research showed that there were common factors in people who become centenarians, people who live to be 100 or more. And so they were eating diets that had clear epigenetic effects. They were uh, doing intermittent fasting by not eating after dinner. So they had a sort of a caloric restriction. And David Sinclair, as I mentioned, was one of the main researchers in caloric restriction. Walter Longo is one of the main researchers in uh, gerontology, uh, longevity medicine, and um, cancer medicine, the health model side of cancer medicine. And so they're pretty interesting papers and they're um, both incredible lecturers. You can find them online. Uh, but in these blue zones, you also had a proper hydration, proper sleep, uh, active lifestyles, uh, normal body composition with good insulin sensitivity. Uh, you had parasympathetic regulation so that there's good stress modulation. And um, I like the Oura Ring, if you're not familiar with that, it's a biofeedback device you can wear on your finger that measures your heart rate variability in your sleep cycle. It helps people to learn to become more parasympathetic dominant, which is a, you know, a problem in our culture that's primarily sympathetic, stress-driven dominant. And so health requires parasympathetic vagal regulation. Um, Time in nature was part of the blue zones. Some kind of deep relaxation, meditation, spiritual orientation is part of the blue zones. Definitely stress modulation, but also found in all places where people live to be healthy centenarians, family and community. There's not the social isolation that exists in our culture in these places. So I think that's significant. And I have to give a plug for Chinese medicine because uh, I'm trained in Chinese medicine and uh, one of my great loves uh, are the technologies of Chinese medicine. And so there's a great tradition of longevity uh, therapies in, in Chinese medicine. And there's a history of, of uh, great longevity in the Chinese culture in certain periods in history, certainly in the upper classes, not in the, the laborers. But um, the the phytochemicals, the Chinese tonic herbs, the Chinese uh, medicinal mushrooms, acupuncture therapy, specific points are used in longevity, uh, the practices of Tai Chi and Qigong, and, and lots of research on some of the uh, specific phytochemicals found in Chinese herbal medicine, lots of longevity research here. That could be another whole day's lecture, but I feel obligated to include that, uh, at least as a mention. So this concludes my lecture content. I want to just show you my course briefly and then we'll do Q&A. So I have this gift of a 10% discount if you are interested. 
The course has over 30 hours of me lecturing my video, and you get a PDF of the slides, you get a study guide summary, you get a MP3 of the lecture, and every module of eight modules has several sections, mini lectures in it, and so that's my core curriculum, and these are the eight modules that comprise that. There is also um, over 33 uh, case studies, there's over 36 advanced mini lectures in a resource library. There's done for you patient handouts. So if you want to be able to support cancer patients and cancer survivors in your practice, that's what I'm doing. And I have these live office hours where I do mentoring. You can ask questions and review your cases. And so um, I welcome you to uh, talk to us about it or reach out or just join us. And uh, now I'll take Q&A for as long as people have questions. Okay, that was awesome, thank you. We do have a few questions coming through and kind of right actually from the beginning. So um, I'll actually uh, go back to one of the first ones that was asked and um, they talk about B vitamins. So how would you dose B vitamins in an elder with extreme fatigue? Well, you have to remember that B vitamins are water soluble. So I think the most important thing is to uh, use a sort of a, a comprehensive B complex of methylated B vitamins. And you don't give high doses of B vitamins because you just urinate them out. So, you know, I might give uh, something like I like Designs for Health B Supreme or Ortho Molecular has a methyl B, you know, one capsule twice a day, something like that. But Remember that the healthy microbiome produces B vitamins as well. So working on the microbiome increases vitamin B status, but vitamin B in the diet comes from whole grains and fermented foods primarily. And, you know, and the elders in America just don't eat well. And so most of them are malnourished. Mm -hmm. Um, and the next question was, is caloric restriction recommended for folks with hyperthyroid issues like Hashimoto's? No, no. If you're on thyroid medication, you have, if you want to do any kind of fasting, you have to be supervised. Anybody who's taking mm -hmm. regular medication, you know, your medication dosing might uh, have to change if you're fasting. So if you, you know, a person who's, uh, has Hashimoto's and has stable, well-managed thyroid disease, could probably do intermittent fasting quite safely, but you wanna do that under the supervision of a professional. You know, I, I have patients, we all have patients that read the internet, go to doctor internet, bad doctor, and, and experiment on themselves. And I've had patients end up in the emergency room because they did some fasting experiment or some ketogenic diet experiment and they became dehydrated and demineralized and they ended up in the emergency room. So, yeah. you know, uh, middle path, you know, middle path. Yeah, I guess along the same kind of lines as what's your take on the fasting mimicking diet? Well, if you really want to learn about the fasting mimicking diet, you can look at Walter Longo's work. Now, he created a product called Prolon, which I do not like. Uh, it's a it's a sort of a done for you five day uh, program of um, progressive calorie uh, diminishing you know decreasing calories over the five days. You're still eating foods that don't trigger insulin, but the food I don't like on it. I don't think it's healthy. So if as a clinician you wanted to design uh, something uh, that was a five day uh, sort of fasting mimicking, you could look at Walter Longo's program and this product and just just copy it with healthier food and it, the the basic uh, goal of intermittent fasting is to give the body a break so that uh, autophagy can be triggered but also to drop insulin and blood sugar and so you can't have somebody who's a hypoglycemic or a diabetic doing these things without supervision you have to modify them for people and if anybody is on diabetic medication or insulin, which is, you know, probably a third of the elder population in America, if not more, they can't do this. You know, you have to first teach them how to eat healthy and exercise and lower their cortisol, and then maybe they could do something like this. But, you know, you have to start giving by giving somebody health first. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, a couple of questions came through when you were talking about um, a cross with the blood and brain barriers on one of your yeah. slides. So in your experience, do you use matcha powder with COMT variances? Very specific question. <laughs> Ask that question again. Would you or do you use, say, matcha powder with its COMT variances? So, T. Okay, so COMT, uh, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are not a problem of a, a blood brain barrier breach. They're, they're a genetic trait, you know, like a methylation defect. So um, let's just differentiate the the blood brain barrier is a single layer epithelial membrane between the brain and the body. And it's there as a gatekeeper to protect certain things from entering the brain. This makes the brain both protected and difficult to treat. So therefore, if we know that a, a patient has say brain inflammation or a brain tumor, we want to understand what does and doesn't cross that gatekeeper membrane. So that was the reason to give you a slide with things that do cross that membrane. That is a completely different uh, issue to say if a person has a methylation defect in the COMT uh, uh, protein, then what do we do about that? So. These are methylation defects, so similar to the MTHFR methylation defect. We have to give methyl donors to these uh, patients. And so uh, a lot of the products that are designed, for example, uh, for homocysteine also have a positive impact on COMT SNPs. So um, then the third, the third thing to consider from this question is what repairs a leaky uh, blood brain barrier. You can just the way you have leaky gut syndrome, you can have leaky blood brain barrier syndrome. And in fact, cancer patients have leaky blood brain barriers. And so the cognitive changes that we associate uh, with, say, chemo brain in cancer patients actually may not be that at all. It may, many, many cancer patients have cognitive changes just because the cancer physiology causes a leaky blood-brain barrier due to the increase in matrix metalloproteinases. So all other syndromes that have an uptick of matrix metalloproteinases, many of the physiology of aging, many elders have a leaky blood-brain barrier and inflamed brains. So for example, melatonin and astragalus are helpful to repairing the blood-brain barrier. Omega-3 fatty acids, which build healthy cell walls, are helpful to build, rebuilding uh, the, uh, any, any epithelial barrier. Vitamin A and curcumin are important to uh, managing inflammatory pathways and inflammasomes and downregulating those. That is helpful to the blood-brain barrier. So um, that's how I think about that. Yeah. And um, there's also another question kind of around that, asked around that same time. Which of the neuroinflammation supplements can't be taken when on blood thinners? Lots of them, because it's an <laughs> educated question, whoever asked that. So you definitely don't want to anticoagulate your patients. So whenever you use nutraceuticals and phytochemicals, you have to be aware of drug actions and drug interactions. So if you have a patient on uh, anticoagulant, is the anticoagulant a platelet inhibition or fibrin inhibition? Because that will govern uh, some of your decisions. So if you don't understand drug nutrient, drug herb interactions, do not give pharmacologic doses of herbs and supplements to your patients because you'll get into trouble. Most of the things that we give are uh, platelet inhibition. Most of the things we give are, are platelet inhibition. There aren't a lot of things that in, inhibit fibrin formation in the uh, plant materia medica. So what are the things to be careful of? Omega-3 fatty acids, curcumin, boswellia. You know, most of the things we use uh, as anti-inflammatories are also act as platelet inhibition. Vitamin C is a, a, inhibits platelet aggregation 
So um, you have to be very, very careful. So if you are newer in practice or you're not accustomed to giving high doses of things the way I have, way I do, then you need to to have a mentor, you know, to help you yeah. make safe decisions uh, about your patients and go on a learning curve. So the other thing, the fact is, there aren't a lot of studies on drug or drug nutrient interactions. So that means you have to learn what the mechanism of action of the drug is, and you know, some drugs we don't even know the mechanism of action. <laughs> but for those that we do. And then if you understand the mechanism of action of a herb or a supplement or a nutraceutical, you can sort of think it through, right? So if you're giving something that has the same mechanism of action as the drug, you are going to amplify that, right? You're going to amplify that. You also have to understand the P450 enzymes that metabolize drugs and herbs so that you don't amplify or inhibit, right? So we know, for example, that a lot of drugs uh, should not be taken concurrently with grapefruit juice, right? So, you, you know, when you are doing nutritional doses of things, you're pretty safe. When you get into giving pharmacologic doses of nutraceuticals and botanicals and phytochemicals, you need to go on a learning curve. You need supervision. You need mentorship. That's how I learned. And um, I also have a background in cell biology. So I make sure I understand so do not be cavalier because our toolbox is powerful. That's why we can help people, but we have to be careful. And we also want to have a seat at the table and a collaborative relationship with physicians. And so we want to demonstrate that we can be in partnership with them, that we are not going to put their patients at risk, that we are not going to mess up the therapeutic plans they have for their patients. And so it's very important to um, be on solid ground and you know as the population ages all of our patients are going to be comorbid and complex and on medications and so you have to take your time you know you have to take your time i often say to patients all of my patients are complex and so because all my patients are cancer patients and so i often say to them at the end of the first visit i'm not ready to give you a treatment plan right now I need to reread your medical records and I need to think about this before I give you my directives. And so I don't put any pressure on myself to give somebody mm -hmm. a plan at the end of the first visit because patients are really complex. So then I might take another hour or two and just restudy their case, study the treatments they've had, the side effects they've had, the other medications they're on, their other comorbidities before I put their plan together because I, number one, want to be in partnership with their physicians and their care team and I want to be a respected member of their team and have their physicians talk with me and I also don't want to get them into trouble. So that's how I approach it because uh, there is a great potential for messing things up for our patients and the, their doctors and so uh take your time you know take your time don't don't make a recommendation to a patient you don't feel confident about just take your time yeah i love that i love that advice i think um also patients appreciate that as well they do they go oh my god you're gonna spend more time on <laughs> yeah I love it. I love it. <laughs> or i'll say i need to talk to your doctor or I want to consult a colleague who knows more about this than I do mm -hmm. before I make my final decisions for you. You know, patients really love that. Yeah. Uh, all right. We have a couple more, but I think maybe I'll do one more question. And then if there's any more, you know, they can reach out to me through webinars at fullscript.com um, or, you know, follow up to the the email we'll send out with the well, recording with any question. Not, you know, let's let's do the ones we can now. I don't have a time limit. Okay. So you know, then okay. we can get it all on the recording. Yeah. So um yeah. Yeah, I totally am. So the next one is definitely more of like I think an opinion question for you. Um but what is your stance on soy and breast cancer? Some say it's okay, some up some say to avoid soy. So you know, this has been an area of confusion for a long time, and I have lectured extensively on this. Um, I just did a lecture uh, on the estrobolone that's also online. And uh, if you if you get on my email list or go to my website, you'll get links to 
the lectures that uh, I have online that you can listen to. But um, I'll give you a short answer. The, this question was a question of great confusion for a long time. However, there's been research done that dispels the confusion. Uh, there is not a contraindication to uh, soy isoflavones and phytoestrogens and breast cancer. And the reason for that is that these phytoestrogens are actually weak estrogens. And so they end up binding to the estrogen receptor and blocking the stronger physiologic estrogens in our system. There's also <clears throat> a lot of research uh, out of China where soy, of course, is a huge part of the diet. And it's been shown that when uh, women's breasts are developing in adolescence and they're exposed to soy in their diet, and remember, more soy than we would ever eat in a day, yeah. right? So the amount of soy we eat is like negligible compared to what Asians eat. <laughs> so it's a good study. So um, uh, Asian women who are exposed to soy uh, on a regular basis and during breast development in adolescence have dramatically lower rates of breast cancer. Mm. And also young men who are uh, exposed to soy during adolescence have dramatically lower rates of prostate cancer. Mm. That's, that's very interesting, actually. Yeah, remember that most of the soy in America is genetically modified. And that the only way to eat soy foods is eat traditional soy foods because they're fermented and processed in ways that makes them digestible. So, uh, you know, Americans, you know, eat soy kind of as entertainment, you know, for the most part. <laughs> not, it's not really a major source of protein in the American diet, but it's a, I think tofu is a very digestible, uh, you know, good, good choice uh, for a, a a plant-based protein for a lot of people. I don't think soy is the enemy at all. Okay. Uh, next question was, how do elders heal or rebuild muscle after muscle wasting? It's really, really, really hard. <laughs> so um, you have to have adequate protein in the diet. You have to have adequate uh, ability to digest protein. So you have to make sure they have enough hydrochloric acid and proteases. So often I'll give elders a a digestive enzyme with hydrochloric acid, but you have to make sure they don't have reflux. Uh, and, you know, a lot of elders have poor protein uh, digestion assimilation because they're all on uh, protein pump inhibitors. <laughs> so you have to take people off of those because if you don't have any hydrochloric acid in your stomach, you can't digest protein. So that's one of the reasons uh, we have problems with mineral absorption and bone loss and muscle losses because so many elders are on protein pump inhibitors like forever, you know? It's so, you have to reevaluate people's medications and say, maybe you don't need this anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's contributing to other problems. So protein digestion, normal protein digestion absorption is required. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to see elders have 60 grams of protein a day. And it, most elders are maybe getting half of it, you know, half. So you have to be creative also, because a lot of elders aren't that interested in food or they eat by themselves. So I often use a protein shake and have that be sort of a digestible, easy way to get protein every day and make the shake have 25 or 30 grams of protein. So they just only have to eat one other thing, yeah. you know, or in a snack uh, for the rest of the day. And then they have to do weight bearing exercise. And so there are um, these, um, there's, I think it's a nationwide company, it's called OsteoStrong, that's a group of physical therapists that's developed exer exercises for bone building, and I often send people there, and, and uh, but you know, like yoga is a weight-bearing exercise, and so, you know, you can, there's lots of ways, you have to find out what somebody's willing to do, but it's hard to get bone mass and muscle mass back. It's really hard work, so the main thing is to prevent the loss of it, and many yeah. disease processes like cancer also cause sarcopenia. And so, you know, it's better to prevent it. And also, another thing that I do is I just give free form amino acids to patients. So I'll give like a free form amino acid, uh, branch chain amino acids plus extra glutamine to patients who are elders, a scoop of each in the morning on an empty stomach with a glass of water and just get more amino acids into them that way they're not going to really eat yeah okay that's great um another kind of 
supplement rec recommendation or your ideal proper dosage for NMN? Um, we might need more context. Yeah, 250, yeah. 250 to 500 a day. It's it, the, the uh, nucle, nicotinamide ribonucleoside, Thorn makes a product called resveracil. And I think it's uh, it's resveratrol plus NR, and I think there's 250 milligrams of each in a capsule. So you take two to four capsules of that a day. And the NMN is made by Designs for Health and Quicksilver as a liposomal sublingual, and the dose for that's two pumps twice a day. Okay, easy. And there I go. People, I've had people with mitochondrial syndromes. Uh, just you know, deep fatigue and dysfunction, and just give them that one supplement, and and their mitochondria start hopping. So, <laughs> worth a try. Amazing. Yeah. All right. I think we have two two more. Um, what is the best course of action for someone who wants to anti age but has early sarcopenia? Penia? Sorry. Well, but... <laughs> that's the, it's the same answer to the loss yeah. of mass right that's the same answer and so you don't want to fast a person who has sarcopenia you know you just want to get them unhealthy normal eating patterns so you know just telling somebody not to eat after dinner is normal you know that's not, you know it's just healthy so you want them to have you know adequate calories and nutrients and exercise and sleep remember that high cortisol also depletes muscle mass so you know you have to assess what's driving it in each person yeah and actually, this last one kind of correlates even with your course that are on the slide here. Um, we have a question, are there any clinics in the EU, ideally Austria, Germany, or Switzerland, that have specialized on age-related diseases, anything you know of, or you know, can anyone take your courses as well? Is oh, yeah. I noticed that there's yeah, recordings I have, and... I have students all over the world. I have students from all... It's really cool. It's really, really cool. I have... I have people from every continent, I think, except Antarctica okay. in, my, yeah. in my course. And it's a self-paced course. So, you know, you go through the lectures and lecture material on your own, and then we get together on the calls, and the calls are recorded if you're in a, like, I have one person in South Africa, and it's like yeah. three in the morning when we meet, and sometimes yeah. she joins us, you know, but wow. otherwise she'll just submit her questions. Um, but um I, I'm really, really niched in cancer and oncology, uh, so I don't really know the answer to that question, but I will say that there's like the Paracelsus Institute in Switzerland, and there are, um, like, I, there's a number of uh, integrative oncology clinics in Germany that may also have other longevity enhancement programs at those facilities. I'm just, I've just been so niched in oncology for so long that I actually don't know the answer to your question. Yeah. You know, there's like, um, in Mexico, there's, um, Sanovive is a pretty good place. Uh, but you know, I really object to these, a lot of these places do kind of a cookbook, same thing on every single person and they mm -hmm. charge you $40,000. I just <laughs> don't think that's a great thing to do. You know, I think it, especially if you're sick, it's nice to be close to home and put together something you can do at home. And also, you know, longevity isn't about going and doing something for a month. It's about a lifestyle, a long-term lifestyle. And so going to a place for, you know, two to four weeks, going on a retreat or something is maybe a reboot and a quick start, but you have to maintain it. And so I really think that, you know, lifestyle changes are hard to make. So, for example, I have a, a, a functional nutrition coach in my practice that helps my patients to implement all the hard things I ask them to do because yeah. it, it's hard, you know. I can't just give them my to-do list, my prescription, and say, go do this by yourself. So uh, you have to have a way to... Uh, support people. You know, I don't do this in my practice, but I, the trend toward group visits is incredibly supportive and increases engagement and, and compliance. So if you have a practice where you can do that, whether it's in person or online, I think that James Maskell of the Functional Forum has yeah. presented a beautiful model of group visits that decreases the cost of care to patients. 
and makes the clinician's time more efficient as well. But the other patients inspire each other and community is created. Um, Mark Hyman uh, was part of a study on, on weight loss many years ago that was done through a group of churches all over the United States. And it was found that obese people who do things together and support each other have more success than when they try to do it by themselves. So there's other factors besides what we tell people to eat and take, you know, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you have to really help people learn to live differently in order to have longevity. There's no quick path to longevity, healthy longevity. So uh, I'll just say in closing, personally, you know, my parents both had cancer. My family history is cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, mm -hmm. osteoporosis, mental illness, and uh, macular degeneration. I have genes for all those things, but I have none of them. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm heading towards 70. And that is because of how I've lived for most of my life, how I've lived a healthy lifestyle, eaten a healthy diet. And so uh, controlled my environmental exposures, taken lots of herbs and supplements, done meditation and yoga and exercise. You know, I have a healthy life and that's why I'm healthy at my age. And so that's what we really have to teach people. That's what we have to teach people how to live. And making healthy choices is about having a healthy relationship to oneself. And so that's actually the barrier for a lot of people is they have to heal their relationship to themselves so yeah. that they make healthy choices psychologically. So it's complicated. It's multifactorial. Yeah, I love this advice and research. I mean, even as, you know, the lay person, I can understand and relate. And I, I think, you know, as the patient side too, would appreciate all this extra care and, and time and, and, you know, passion behind, behind the practitioners and healing and longevity. So I, I love this presentation. I've learned a lot myself. I know, um, I believe our attendees have as well with the questions that came through. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that this is being recorded and that you will get um, a copy of it. And to, we can add in, um, Dr. Tilka, we can add in these links for your courses and any other resources you'd like to include. I know that in the recording, they come up on the slides as well. So, you know, people can, can see the links there if they need to use them as well, but we can always include them on, great. on the That'd landing great. page. Thank yeah, you. anything else. And so um, I guess to wrap it up, I'll thank you again for being, us, uh, being here with us today. I always love, love our webinars together. And I, as I said, I learned so much. So um, thank you for taking the time with us and um, we hope that we can see you again soon. <laughs> thank you, bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Have a good uh, rest of the day, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.